Hello, Overcomers, and welcome to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. I'm Runsi, the founder of Overcome, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Dr. Beverly Zavaleta. So she is a board-certified family physician, a cancer survivor, and a longtime advocate for patient education. And so Dr. Zavaleta received her medical degree from Harvard Medical School and practices as a hospitalist physician in South Texas. She's also the author of the brilliant book, Braving Chemo. And we are so excited to share that we will be doing a give- giveaway of this book today as you watch. So um, as you watch, please type in the comment sections below your name so that you can have a chance to win this brilliant book. And um, if you have any questions, of course, as we um, go along with the discussion, please type in the comment sections below also, and we will try to address all your questions post the discussion. So with that, Welcome, I'm Dr. Zavaleta, to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. It's such an honor to have you. Thank you, Ronsi. It's so glad to be here. And um, I brought my coffee. Wonderful. So I'm... That's how we can. <laughs> That's why. Yeah, I'm, re- I'm ready to go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for having me. Welcome. It's really, really glad. Uh, I'm you, so before, glad to be here. Before we start, can you quickly show us your book? so that we can all get excited about it. Yeah, this is uh, Braving Chemo. And uh, the subtitle is What to Expect, How to Prepare and How to Get Through It. Wonderful. Uh, I published it in 2019, so it's been out just over a year. And just as we mentioned, this is a book today. You have a chance to win this book. So please type in your name in the comment sections below as you're watching so that we can enter your name for a chance to win this this amazing book. So thank you, Beverly. Um, So as a cancer survivor, can you tell us the, the primary challenges you faced while receiving chemotherapy and what gaps in information and education did you experience that you would want to share with our overcomers? Yes, so, um, so let me tell a little bit, if you don't mind uh, backing up just a tiny bit um, about my story. I, I am a physician. Um, and I was practicing as a hospitalist and I had been in a high risk surveillance group for breast cancer. I had had some benign lumps and bumps and had had a few biopsies already. And I had another lump that I needed to get checked. And so I went through another biopsy and honestly, I I wasn't that nervous at the time because um, having been through the process a couple of times, I think I had become a little bit almost blasé about the process. Mm -hmm. And I think for your uh, audience, it's quite, that's quite different from what your audience experiences. Uh, However, what I think they may uh, identify with is that because I was not anxious about the biopsy process, when my, it was actually my family doctor that broke the news to me over the phone. um, And I was completely blindsided, just absolutely flattened, floored, shocked, whatever word you want to use to describe. And so, because I just wasn't expecting it. It's almost like when you get several benign biopsies, it almost, it's, you're lulled into a sense of security, I think is the best way to describe it. So um, it, it was then after that, a, a whirlwind of further uh, tests. I had an MRI and then I had several visits with a uh, surgeon, plastic surgeon, oncologist. Um, so, and that all took place over about two weeks. I had a port placed and I was getting chemotherapy just, I, I wanna say it was like 15 days after my diagnosis. So it was really, really fast. Um, and, and if there's any part of that that you wanna get back to after I answer your actual question, then we can circle back to it. Um, so, your question was, where were my gaps in knowledge? And um, I definitely had a lot of advantages being a physician because I, there was a lot that I understood about how the medical system worked and how to advert, how to, um, you know, if I needed tests done or how to make appointments, I could work within the system better. 
However, I'm not an oncologist. I trained as a family physician. I was working as a general adult hospitalist. So I, I had a lot to learn about the specifics of my type of cancer. I certainly was not up to date on the specifics of what my treatment would entail. I mean, that is the, that is the level of detail of oncology that, um, that generalist physicians, whether it's internal medicine, family, family medicine, um, pediatricians, those generalists, we don't know every detail of each. I mean, there are, there are nine types of breast cancer alone. And even within ovarian cancer, there are many, many subtypes of ovarian cancer. So, so even as a physician, I did not have that specific knowledge. So I had to quick learn about what was my specific type? What was the tissue type? What were all the hormone markers? Um, and then what did that mean? Um, something that surprised me was that I was going to have chemotherapy first. Yeah. I did not know that. So I had, by the luck of the draw, I had all my appointments backwards. I saw the plastic surgeon first, and then I saw the surgeon, and then I saw the oncologist. And that had to do with scheduling. That I didn't do it on purpose. It was just however you, they could fit me in. And so by the time I saw the oncologist, I was already talking about reconstruction. And the oncologist said, okay, yeah, but time out. That, that's, that's not going to happen for months from now because the first thing we need to do is we need to kill any possible circulating tumor cell in your body. And that, I just remember thinking that, that kind of, um, it was almost like she, she, it, it was as if she had physically taken my shoulders and just sat me down and said, okay, let, let's focus your mind on what you need to do. Re, reorient mm -hmm. you. And, um, so, so, I mean, those were the gaps really. What, what exactly, what exactly was my type of cancer? And what did that mean as far as planning the treatment, mm -hmm. which I think is that's, that's step one for anybody who has been diagnosed. And you mentioned that you being a physician yourself, if you grappled with that information, you can imagine that, you know, the rest of us who are not in the medical field, if we get diagnosed by something, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, any kind of cancer, it's just, it's just an overwhelming um, you know, plethora of information that we have to digest even before we get to the treatment level. So it's, it's just a lot. So um, thank you for mentioning that. And in terms of, you know, regardless of the type of cancer, whether it be ovarian or breast cancer, the eff effects of chemotherapy are often similar. It's, it's, you know, same issues and challenges that we face. So can you briefly tell us about the, uh, the side effects you experienced while undergoing chemotherapy? And we understand that, you know, may, that may be a little different for, uh, for breast cancer versus ovarian cancer, but like we said, I mean, there are certain things which will be similar. So if you could just talk about it, that would be wonderful. Yes, so, um, I, I'm happy to do that. and. Uh, Interestingly, um, okay, so preventing and limiting the side effects of chemotherapy is my uh, mission right now through writing my book and also my outreach that I do on my website and blogging and, and my contacts in the cancer world. Um, and a lot of that comes from what I experienced and then also my community that I became part of as I entered the cancer world. So sort of my, I was, I was going to say my cancer friends, but you all know what I mean. Um, you know, you become part of the community. And um, so, yes, even though everybody's different, uh, we do share some things. So uh, I had hair loss. Uh, so I had triple negative breast cancer and actually of the breast cancers, tri triple negative is the most similar to some forms of ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably many people don't know that, but there are a lot of, uh, similarities. So I received two types of chemotherapy. I received carboplatin mm -hmm. and I also received a taxane, um, 
I received Taxol. So both of those are used heavily in ovarian cancer. So uh, there, there is a, a lot of overlap if you receive those two medications. So hair loss was one. Um, I also had severe fatigue, anemia, and then by the end of my treatment, I think what affected me the most and is still affecting me today is neuropathy. Mm -hmm. So the hair loss, eventually my hair grew back and uh, not quite the same as it was, but I do have hair, which is great. I enjoy having hair. And the anemia uh, took a few months to resolve, but that also resolved. And the neuropathy, which is um, abnormal nerve function affecting mostly my feet, legs, uh, and fingers, um, numbness, but also burning and tingling. So it's it's not just absence of feeling, but it's uh, can be pain and excessive feeling. In other words, things that shouldn't hurt can hurt or a light touch can feel like an exaggerated touch. So dysfunction of the nerves. And that unfortunately has stayed with me. It improved quite a bit, but um, I, still, I still have it, uh, probably a mild to moderate amount. And that affects my uh, balance and my ability to do certain forms of exercise and activities. Um, although I, it is better when I was at my worst, which was at about a month after I completed my chemo, I was almost not able to walk. I could only walk or stand about one to two hours a day. And that was cumulative. So over the course of the day, if I wanted to get up, take a shower um, and run any errands, I had about an hour or two of being on my feet time. And once that was used up, I was done. So to go from that to, be, to being highly functional, which is uh, what I consider myself now, is a huge improvement. Um, so that, 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 I, I think, uh, and it's something that a lot of people struggle with. I, I mean, I think the numbers are anywhere between 50 to 80% of people who receive these types of chemotherapy drugs experience some type, some degree of neuropathy at some point. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone, um, any of our overcomers that are, uh, probably getting diagnosed as we speak or has been recently diagnosed um, and currently signed up for chemotherapy, what um, guidance would you have them uh, give them in terms of managing anxiety and just, you know, just in terms of what to expect? Yeah, so uh, anxiety is a big one. Um, first of all, it's normal to feel anxious about whatever's coming. I mean, if you have just, if you're at the beginning, it's, it's normal to feel anxious. There, there's, uh, I, I mean, there's almost no way not to feel apprehensive or scared about what's coming with your treatment because um, you don't know how you're gonna feel. That being said, not, not everybody, um, not everybody gets terrible neuropathy. Not everybody gets terrible nausea and vomiting. My, my nausea was fairly mild uh, and I never had vomiting. Um, some people have it a lot worse, but, but I didn't. Now I, I did take, I was very careful to take a lot of preventive measures and, and I can talk about that a little bit more about what I did to prevent that. Um, so I think, uh, I would, I would recommend that people try to not get caught up in the anxiety. In other words, recognize, okay, I'm, I'm anxious. That's okay. That's normal. And um, <laughs> I tend to personify my emotions sometimes a little bit and, and, and it might sound silly, but I talk to them a little bit like, okay, anxiety, I see you, but all right, like you're here, I okay, but you know what? Now that I've talked to you and said hello, can you please just 
sit over there because I have to have the rest of my day now love as that. I kind of have a little conversation. <laughs> I love that. And taking it a little further, maybe just give it a name too, right? While at it, <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I think, um, you know, I did that a lot with fear as well. Uh, kind of naming fear and saying, okay, all right, fear, we're here, we're going to chemo today, like, you know, uh, and it almost, I think because I felt a little bit, I also used humor a lot, like um, being a little bit silly about it, because you feel a little bit silly talking to yourself, like, okay, I'm talking to myself again on my way to chemo. And um, there was one of my friends who, um, designated herself the official uh dark humor uh captain of dark humor for the my whole chemo experience and so she would send me these funny comics she sent me a couple audiobooks uh humorous audiobooks to listen to and so she and i would have funny conversations about stuff like that about you know me talking to myself on the way to chemo that you have to kind of talk yourself up to go do it because it is scary um and kind of get yourself in the mood and and uh i mean there are just kind of there are a lot of funny memes out there and and jokes about chemo and you know about ha you know having you know it's the strongest cocktail you'll ever drink and just just kind of these silly things and i think it's a combination of dark humor that it's it's, it's not a laughing matter that it, it does take strength and courage to do it, to face it. But at the same time, when you're kind of poking fun at it, it lightens it just enough that you don't get sucked down into that dark hole when you're trying to find that courage. Um, which is why I named the book Braving Chemo. <laughs> And, and that is my, that's a brilliant segue into my next question, because I was going to ask you, why did you decide to write the book, Braving Chemo? And tell us um, how folks that might be interested to purchase the book, how can they access it? So, um, so the book was inspired by a very close friend of mine who Oh, I'm sorry, I just got kind of emotional <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> um, she's alive, so no worries. Um, she's a good friend of mine. She lives here. She and her family are good family friends of ours. And her sister was diagnosed with cancer uh, probably about a month after me. And um, so she was going through cancer diagnosis and having, uh, she had a surgery and then a chemo and um, so the three of us were texting and, and having email and calling and, and I mean, I was not her doctor, obviously, but I was assisting her with some of these, um, like what we call in medicine curbside consults. I was explaining some medical things and then side effects. She was asking me about things like nausea and, um, skin rashes and just just some things related to her treatment and then maybe about four or five months later my friend who she's actually a university professor here and she said and she's in she has a phd in education and she said you really need to write a book with everything that you have taught us mm -hmm. and i said oh no, no, i can't do that i'm i'm you know I, I'm just a month or a month after my surgery. I'm I'm too tired and I just want to go, you know, get busy and go back to work or whatever. And she said, Well, no, I really think you should write a book. And um so she just kept on me, basically. <laughs> she just kept nagging me to do that. So after a few months went by, I I decided that she that maybe she was right. And so um, so I, so I started working on it and, um, it took five years of different iterations and, and I mean, there was a lot between there and here, but, um, but that was the, that was the beginning was, was just working with that one, um, friend and her family. 
And I guess I realized that if they needed something like this, then probably other people did too. Absolutely. And thank you for writing. And I'm pretty sure many, many um, of our overcomers uh, will and have been <clears throat> the um, wonderful information that you have shared in this book. And for those of you that are watching, remember that you're going to get a copy of this book as a giveaway. So type in your name in the comment sections as we chat so that we can collect them and then um, enter you for a chance to win this amazing book. So back to my question. So um, I know that you wanted to share a few tips that you would like to give to our overcomers in managing the uh, chemotherapy treatment and overcoming side effects. So while you were going through your chemotherapy, tell us what factors would make your top 10 list of absolutely must do's uh, while in chemotherapy that you would want to share with us. So, um, I think the, the first thing is not a specific tip for side effects, but, but let me even kind of back up a little bit. The first thing is plan to ask for help. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And that was something that was not easy for me. Um, I'm a fixer. I, I'm a fixer by nature and I'm also a doctor. So I give orders for a living. So I'll admit it. I, um, I, I mean, it's, it's not in my nature to, to ask for help, but when I got my diagnosis, something, something must've just hit me over the head. And I knew, I just, I just knew I was going to need help. And so I did. I, I just asked for help. I just, I talked to my friends. I talked to my family very quickly and I, I just, I just started asking and I'm so glad that I did. And I was overjoyed and grateful that people were willing to help. And I think, I think we often underestimate how much people really are willing to help. And so that would be that would be number one. And, and don't feel embarrassed about it. It's very hard. We all feel like we want to be self-sufficient and we're embarrassed and we don't want to be seen as weak. And this is a whole nother podcast episode, but there's a lot of pressure to be strong and fight and be the good cancer patient. And there's all this weird societal pressure that a lot of us feel. That's all just malarkey and there's no right way to have cancer and and we just we we are nobody is an island and we need to ask for help and that's the way we get through it is together so that would be number one um now in terms of specific sort of actionable practical things um another so, something that's very important is if you want to try to preserve hair and prevent hair loss, which is an option now, but was not five years ago when I was doing my treatment, the options for what's called cold capping or cryotherapy, they were not FDA approved at the time. So they were experimental and you had to pay cash and whatnot, but now they're all, many, many options are FDA approved. Sometimes they're covered by insurance. Uh, if not, there are many charitable organizations that will pay, you can apply and have it paid for through the charitable organization. And that decision needs to be made before you have your first chemo. So I would say if you're interested in trying to preserve your hair, which often can preserve between 40 to 80% of hair, then you need to research that and figure it out and get it going before your first treatment. So that's that item. And that is a very important and, part of the piece of information. Thank you for sharing that 40 to 80% is pretty significant. Yes. Yes. I think, I mean, people should know it's not a hundred percent because but, mm -hmm. yeah, you still will have some usually thinning. And so, um, 
if you work with the companies, um, Penguin Cold Caps is one, Pax, the two biggest are Paxman, P-A-X-M-A-N, and Penguin Cold Caps. Both of those companies, you can look directly on their websites. And then if your insurance doesn't cover you, they can put you in touch with the different charitable organizations that can help with payment. And um, they can guide through the, I, I don't want to necessarily take up all the time talking about this, but but hair is really important and it's more important, not so much just for, I mean, it, it is for one's personal identity, but it's more than that because um, I think the best way I've heard this described is hair loss is your tell that you have cancer. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. it's your public statement. It's like being outed that you have cancer. Um, so for example, um, if a man has prostate cancer, prostate cancer is not treated with chemotherapy. Pretty much he can go around and, and nobody knows publicly, even if, um, even if he's incontinent and he's wearing you know, an incontinence garment under his clothes, that's not visible. Imagine if he had to walk around wearing that on the outside of his pants and then everybody would know that he had prostate cancer or what have you. It just as an, as, as an example. But when you're bald and you have, I said in the book, I describe it as that's what gives you that cancer patient look. Mm -hmm. And so you're automatically outed if you, if you are bald or, or even if you're wearing a headscarf typically. Um, obviously, if you wear a wig, then you can get around it, but it has to be a really good wig um, because a wig that's obviously a wig also outs you. So I think for a lot of women, the cold capping is their way of, it's just privacy. It's not vanity, it's privacy. And that's a huge thing. In other words, I don't want me having cancer treatment to be the main issue that everybody either talks about or thinks about, or, you know, I don't want to bring that to work. I just want to go to work or I don't want to bring that to well, whatever you're doing, the P PTA meeting or what have you. So anyway, I just wanted to, to put that out there. Um, what was the question? <laughs> you were talking about the uh, the top factors that would make your um, list of to do's while um, yes. undergoing chemotherapy. We talked about the hair, and um, um, so we were moving on to the next. Okay. What else would you do in in terms of your guidance? Um, your the specific side effect management, I think. Yes. So. <clears throat> What I see as a hospitalist in my patient care is in terms of um, the worst side effects during chemotherapy, what I see in taking care of patients is the nausea and vomiting mm -hmm. because patients, because people get dehydrated. They are not able to stay ahead of taking in enough fluids and food to maintain themselves. And then they get admitted to the hospital needing IV, primarily IV fluids, but they also aren't eating enough and they're getting more and more malnourished. And then the more malnourished you are, you're, you're basically starving mm -hmm. and your body is getting weaker and weaker. You're literally digesting your own muscles. You're having what's called cancer cachexia, which means digesting your own body. Um, now, forgive me me. I, I know that just sounds, ter I say it like it's nothing. It's, I'm sure it sounds terrifying to non-medical people. Um, but so most of it is probably. So staying hydrated. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying so staying hydrated and eating a good diet. It sounds like it is very paramount while you're going through chemotherapy, especially the hydration yes. part, right? Yeah. Yes. And and it is preventable, but you do, I think, but, but it's, it's easier said than done. And, and it really needs to be, it's really something that I think people need to have specific instructions. They need to take a lot of care. They usually need help. In other words, what I uh, recall as a patient, I mean, I had the advantage of knowing ahead of time that that was gonna be of paramount importance I had it foremost in my mind 
and I really got ahead of it. And so there were two things that I did that were uh, instrumental. One, taking my anti-nausea medicine on a schedule for 72 hours after every treatment. So not waiting until you feel nauseous to take that medicine. And I had three different anti-nausea medications and I took them in a staggering fashion around the clock on a schedule for three days. Mm -hmm. And then eating also on a schedule, small amounts, like six times a day snacks. Mm -hmm. And I had planned it out in advance. When I've described this, so, so now, again, I'm not an oncologist, I'm a general adult hospitalist. So, so when I do admit patients who have gotten down into this dehydration hole, and I, and I mean, every, honestly, knock wood, everybody that I've admitted, they've bounced right back up and in a few days they're able to go home and then they usually take a little break from chemo and then they're off back to their oncologist again. But what I tell them is I said, think of yourself like a newborn baby, mm. a newborn baby, Okay, in a small percentage of cases, the mom and the baby have perfect compatibility and everybody is eating Fine. and happy mm -hmm. and sleeping and whether you're breastfeeding or bottle feeding, it's all just wonderful and the baby cries and you feed on demand and it's fabulous, okay? But really, like that's a small amount of cases. Usually the baby is fussy and then you have to look at your watch and then you have to, you know, uh, or maybe there's a breastfeeding mismatch and you have to encourage the baby to eat and the baby is screaming and then you have to swaddle the baby. There's all this, there's, uh, there's difficulties. So you make a feeding schedule. Why? Because if you don't, the baby gets dehydrated. Mm -hmm. So I said, think, I say, think of yourself like a newborn baby. You need to put yourself on a schedule. You need to pay attention to what you're eating pay attention to how much you're urinating. Cause what do we do with the babies? We count the diapers, you know? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> actually I had a family recently say to me, oh gosh, please don't make me look at my dad's like, you know, urine or what have you. I said, well, no, you just, just ask him if he's gone, you know, how much he's going to the restroom or what have you. But if you can do that for yourself, put yourself on a schedule and pay attention to that so that because once you're already so dehydrated that you just don't even want to get out of bed, what happens as a patient is you, you lose your judgment. You're just, you want to just send everybody out of your room. You just want to stay in your bed. And before you know it, you haven't moved in 12 hours. You haven't eaten anything in 12 hours and you haven't gone pee in 12 hours. You're dehydrated. Mm -hmm. You're behind, you're, you're behind. You're a half a day behind. So um, so the specific tips are use a schedule, take the meds on a schedule, eat on a schedule and be very aware. And I give instructions to it, it, if you're, you know, if you're not urinating, uh, and you can't eat anything in 12 hours, you got to call your doctor, Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Like 12 hours. That's the cutoff. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you talked about neuropathy, right? So um, I know you have mentioned that, you know, it's been a few years, but you're still kind of experiencing it and kind of managing it. I know that several of our overcomers have the same challenge as you do um, as mm -hmm. one of the uh, lingering effects of chemo, right? So what would you say personally, first of all, what have you done to manage and what would you, um, how would you guide our overcomers uh, with this that may be facing the same challenge? Yes, thank you for asking that. That That is, peripheral neuropathy from chemo is a, is a big problem. Um, so when I first, uh, when it first came on, um, I, I told my oncologist when it, when it, at the first sign. So I was, let's see, I had 16 rounds of chemo. I think it was, it started coming on at round 12, maybe. Mm -hmm. So I, I told her about it. It was minor at first. Um, she, she didn't do any sort of dose reduction. So, th so that's the first thing. Make sure you tell your oncologist the minute it starts. 
So whenever, if you feel any sort of tingling or numbness or shooting pains in your fingers and toes, that's usually where it starts, make sure you tell your oncologist immediately. Um, she did start me on a B-complex vitamin at that time. There's not a whole lot of scientific research evidence supporting that that is helpful, but your oncologist might start you on it, especially at the time I was very anemic. So she had me on iron. So I think she put the B vitamins as a complement to the iron that I was taking. So again, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you take B vitamins, I'm, but I'm suggesting that you ask your oncologist and there may be some things your oncologist will do. Um, she, it did get worse. So my chemo ended, but the neuropathy continued to get worse. This is a very common pattern because of the cumulative effects of the chemo drugs. So part of that is due to one, the drugs do accumulate in your body and they're held in your fat cells. So it takes actually weeks, if not a couple of months for the, dr for the drug to completely metabolize and go out of your body. So unfortunately it can continue to affect your nerves. Mm -hmm. That's one reason. The second reason is that the damage that was done from that last chemo, the nerve continues to, to die, basically. In other words, it's like if, imagine if you put the weed killer on the weeds, they don't all die just within that first hour that the weed killer is there. There's a slow die off mm -hmm. and that's what happens. So it, I continued to get worse for about six weeks after the last chemo. She first put me on gabapentin, which is the generic of a, it's actually an anti-seizure medication that is commonly used for neuropathy. Uh, it didn't work for me. And it also made me a little bit, uh, it, it made, it, it caused a little bit of swelling mm. and um, depression. So that wasn't good. So, uh, and it didn't work. So I stopped it. Um, and then I was on nothing for a while. And then about another month later, she suggested that I try acupuncture. Mm. So quite honestly, I was not, I, I didn't really want to try acupuncture. Um, and at that point I had not, uh, this gets back to your very first question, which was my knowledge gaps. So at that point I had not done, I didn't really know anything about mm. neuropathy, specifically about chemotherapy induced neuropathy. As a, as a family physician, I knew a lot about diabetes related neuropathy because that's extremely common, but those two entities are completely different. Um, for example, uh, gabapentin works very well for diabetes induced neuropathy, but the research shows that it does not work for chemotherapy induced neuropathy. Um, so, I looked at the research for acupuncture and chemotherapy induced neuropathy, and there was some. And so I decided to do it, although I was still very skeptical because the there wasn't very much research back in 20, it was early 2016. But it actually worked. It was, it was phenomenal. I, I had, I ended up having six treatments, but after just the first two, it made a huge difference. I, started regaining quite a bit of sensation. And um, uh, it was almost like a jump start. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that is something that I would really recommend to people if they have access to it. Sometimes it's covered by insurance, sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. um, it's not horrendously expensive, especially if you do, it, it, again, it's not like a drug that you might take for years. Usually you do six treatments or maybe 10 treatments. Um, so it's a time limited thing. Um, and, and then interestingly, it's been uh, pretty rigorously studied in the last five years mm -hmm. and has good evidence for it now that it didn't have five years ago. So, um, so I did acupuncture and now I take a medication called duloxetine, which is the generic for Cymbalta, which is in the class of medications of SNRI antidepressants, but they also work for 
different types of pain. So there's something in the way they work neurologically that um, they're approved for osteoarthritis pain. Mm -hmm. And they also have been shown in studies to work for chemotherapy induced um, neuropathic pain. So. And that's wonderful information. And we would obviously um, encourage all of you that are watching to go speak with your physician about uh, the uh, options that are available to you. And uh, very thankful to you, um, Dr. Zavaleta, for uh, you know sharing all this great information. So now, um, in terms of diet, you know, uh, is, did you did you follow anything in specific while you were going through chemotherapy? Any changes in your uh, food habits that helped you? Um, even like recover after chemo, anything that you can share with us? I mean, whole grains, switching to, you know, um, that sort of thing. Anything that you would like to share on the diet part? Yeah, so first of all, I want to say that the most important thing is for people to make sure that they can, they're, they're staying hydrated. So drink as much uh, water as they can, not get dehydrated. Maybe the only exception is if you do have heart disease or kidney disease that you following your instructions from your doctor, because there are instances that that you um, might have to limit your fluid intake. So make sure you follow the instructions from your own doctor about that. Um, the second thing is that when you're having a hard time eating, the most important thing for you to eat is whatever you can eat. So when you're on chemo, um, and I say that because it's very easy to get caught up in, I wanna eat something healthy. I wanna eat an anti-cancer diet. I should be eating more vegetables. All of that is good. But during chemo, when you are feeling like you're, you know, you're sucking on a penny and your mouth tastes metallic and everything makes you nauseous. I almost don't care what you eat. Just try to eat whatever you can that you, you know, that doesn't make you sick. And so give yourself a break. Don't feel guilty. Just eat what you can. That's the most important thing. Okay. So if you've satisfied that criteria, and you you can eat a, and you can eat a variety. Then you can start worrying about a little bit more about um, you know eating the right things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if if we if we're if you're able to eat a variety and and maybe not struggling so much just to get enough calories in, then I would say um, and I do I do have a nutrition section in Braving Chemo. Uh, it's fairly short because uh, there are other resources that discuss in detail, excuse me, uh, chemotherapy, nutrition, and eating during cancer treatment that I think are really good resources out there. And I list them in the book. I actually have some resources in the book too about nutrition. Um, trying to get protein snacks at every meal. Um, eating a little bit of fat as well, because those things will settle your stomach and reduce nausea. Um, trying to get some fiber, because fiber also reduces both diarrhea and constipation. So I talk about things, uh, oatmeal is a really good one. Um, so is fruit fiber. So things like applesauce, um, cooked beans, so, um, pureed bean soup, like um, lentil soup, um, split pea soup, um, cooked beans like uh, Mexican style black beans or pinto beans, if you put them in an immer immersion blender or in a blender, so they're blended up. I just say blended because sometimes if they have a lot of skins on them, people find them maybe harder to eat. So, um, so those things are really good because that fiber is really good for the gut. It also is, it's considered a prebiotic, meaning it, it promotes proper bacterial culture, healthy bacteria inside your gut. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're not, if you're able to eat more types of things and you're not struggling so much just to keep things down, then you want to be eating those oatmeal, beans, um, applesauce, a little bit of protein at every meal that'll help prevent nausea. 
I have a smoothie rep recipe in the book. Um, I talk about drinking tea and using ginger as anti-nausea as well, if you wanna do that in addition to your anti-nausea medicines. The other thing, and then the last thing I'll say about diet is I talk about disinfecting your fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because if you're going to eat fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables, meaning not, not cooked, because if it's cooked, then you can just rinse it and then cook it and that'll kill any of the germs. But when you're on chemotherapy, your immune system typically is going to be quite low, especially uh, periodically. Mm -hmm. So there's gonna be a point between your chemotherapy treatments when your immune system is very low and you're extremely susceptible to infection and you can get food poisoning from any bacteria or viruses or uh, any sorts of germs that are on the fresh fruits and vegetables. So I discuss how to disinfect those fresh fruits and veggies and give you a recipe to make at home on how to do that. Um, if you're motivated, if you're not, because God help us, like who has time to be doing that, then just eat applesauce or just cook your veggies and call it a day. Like now is not the time to be messing with a fresh fruit smoothie. Like it just takes too much time. So yeah. That's wonderful uh, advice. Thank you so much. And um, just as a this switching gears just a little bit, um, as a survivor yourself, uh, the fear of cancer coming back is one of the, the top most um, concerns that all overcomers have, right? So um, as a survivor yourself, tell us how you manage this fear or anxiety and what would you share with our overcomers in terms of doing the same? fear. Yep. Other than giving it a name, right? <laughs> <Talking> to... <laughs> yeah. I know. I think of it as, yeah, capital, capital F fear. Like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> um, so the way, so I would say early on, um, it was, uh, it was worse. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to, you know, every day it was more of a gripping physical sensation type of fear. Um, although because I was more wrapped up in my treatment, it was easier to be distracted. Um, and that's just how it was distracted by, do, you know, doing my treatment. I was busy. Then once the treatment's over, you graduate into, you know, congratulations. Welcome to the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. It actually, ironically, I think gets a little harder. And I know a lot of people feel that too, because now you're not distracted. Now you have to, now you have to figure out how to incorporate yourself back into yourself or, or what. And, um, I would say that we had a reckoning, my husband and I, I mean, we had a reckoning of how do we want to structure our life? Um, you, it, it maybe wasn't so visible to other people on the outside in the sense of we didn't move to a different city or neither one of us really took different jobs. I restructured my work a little bit. I wanted to retain flexibility. Um, but the, re but the restructuring also involved, we really, um, we moved the, we moved the bucket list up. Um, and that helps to me deal with fear because I, so it was a, like the big bucket list thing, like taking the kids places, um, and not just travel, but doing things mm -hmm. with people and the family and just doing things in general, like like the, the big B bucket list, because I, I felt like um, I, I just wanted to just start doing all those things. And, and I, I mean, I'm not unique. That's, I think, a very common 
reaction because, okay, I'm okay today. So I'm going to work on these things today. And if I have a recurrence, you know, a few months from now or a year from now or a few years from now, I just, I want to be glad that I did all of these things and that I have been doing all of these things. And so, um, just taking one day that really, yeah, to me, that makes the fear less because there, because then, uh, I have less fear of, you know, maybe it's not fear of death as much as fear of regret yeah, and missing out on things. You know. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> And that thing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's so, for all of us, right? Because you know it's a natural um, ending to all our lives, and one day or it is going to happen. It is going to come today or tomorrow. We don't know. But mm -hmm. like you said, just doing things that you have always wanted to do, but kind of not pushed, pushed, and then being busy and other things just come in the way. Just doing those things make life so much more sweeter. And then I think it takes the fear away. Uh, to a large extent so so thank you for uh, for sharing that information and so um i have to ask you about vaccination and covid because this is such a yes. important topic for all of us right now so as a doctor and a cancer survivor um what is your opinion on vaccination? Why should our overcomers take the vaccine? And uh, especially those that are, you know, thinking or, or probably not 100% confident um, in the medicine or the, the, you know, concerned about the side effects. What would you say to them um, in terms of the vaccinations and the merits of it? This is a really, really important question. And I want to clearly say that I recommend, well, I recommend that they ask their own oncologist because each person may have a specific reason that they shouldn't get the vaccine. But in general, cancer survivors and people, certainly people with active cancer are at high risk for severe disease and death from COVID especially people with lung disease or blood cancers, but other cancers, um, solid tumors, including ovarian cancer, are at high risk from severe COVID disease and death from COVID. So right now there's actually today that uh, is ongoing uh, um, some um, panel discussion to try to get people with cancer, a high priority status for receiving COVID vaccine. So I would encourage them to, if they're cleared by their oncologist, to get the vaccine if offered. And if they have specific questions, I recommend going to the Pfizer and Moderna websites to read about the vaccine, go to the CDC to read about the vaccine, and and actually, I'm pretty active on Twitter and Instagram, but on my Twitter feed, I have tweeted a couple of threads. I have uh, boosted their uh, threads by other scientists about the development of the vaccine and the decision process from other doctors about this issue of how they came to their decision to trust the vaccine development process. So if they're interested, you can go to my Twitter feed, which is Bizavaleta MD, and look at that because I thought it was a great explanation of that. Um, briefly, that this mRNA vaccine technology has been in development for 20 years. So uh, the biggest thing that I've heard from people is, oh my gosh, how do, how do we do this in 10 months? And the answer is, it wasn't 10 months, it was 20 years. <laughs> so, um, so people should really feel confident. I'm fully vaccinated because I do work in the COVID units. And so I was part of that frontline healthcare worker that got the first, very first round of vaccine in my community. We are, we have been vaccinating um, the phase 1B, which is the people 65 and older. So my in-laws were able to get vaccinated about um, 10 days ago. So uh, I'm very thankful for that. And, um, Hopefully, all of our cancer survivors will be able to be vaccinated soon as well. 
Yeah, and thank you for, for mentioning the fact that you yourself took the vaccination that and you are recommending, your in-laws got it, and so you're recommending it mm -hmm. for the rest of the, the cancer survivors because it's important for us to know who else have gotten it, especially the ones that we know mm -hmm. and trust, you know, and, and to understand. Yes especially uh, if you are sitting on the fence about it and not really sure whether or not you should be taking the vaccine. These kinds of conversations really help us make that decision and change that mindset that we might have. And there's nothing right or wrong about it. It's just a mindset, right? So uh, we can do what we can to clear any doubts. So thank you for, for doing that for us. My last question to you, is uh, what message of overcoming would you like to share with our audience before um, we uh, end this conversation? Well, I think I'll give a message of mindset because uh, I love to think about mindset. Um, there are many, many mindsets for overcoming. And I think we I briefly mentioned the, the fighting mindset earlier on getting ready to go into chemo, but there are so many others. And um, I talk about a journey mindset in the book. I talk about a healing mindset. And um, I think it's important for each of us to find our own mindset, which is really a framework. Um, and we can, we can try them on like so many different outfits and you don't always feel the same way, the same day, you don't wear the same outfit. Mm -hmm. So you want to be flexible and open to that and to use as many mindsets as you need so that you can overcome. And that's really important for our own mental health. And, um, and we can, it's something that evolves and we can keep working on it. And it, it makes us uh, stronger, but also fuller and deeper and healthier. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a wonderful way to to overcome. Absolutely. And I, I could not agree with you more than that. Thank you so very much for this fabulous conversation. You shared so much uh, with us in terms of your own personal experience and your insights as a, as a doctor. So that is really important. And so we, we deeply um, thank you for uh, being a part of this uh, series, being a guest today and for sharing all your great wisdom with us. Um, and so overcomers, we remember we are giving away her brilliant book, uh, Braving Chemo. So uh, if you want a chance to win, you need to be typing your name in the comment sections below so that we can enter your name for a chance to win this fabulous book by Dr. Beverly Zavaleta. And so with that, um, and also know that we need you to talk, keep talking about ovarian cancer because the more we talk about it, the more awareness we raise. And um, we will be back with the next episode of Connect Over Coffee very soon. Until then, um, take care and goodbye. Thank you.